If you think of political philosophy in the late 17th century, you think John Locke is. John Locke speaks directly to us. John Locke was an abstract philosopher. Oh, his second treatise on civil government was uh, very much, um, it was very much based on English constitutional practice of the day. But it has a sufficient degree of abstraction to speak to all of you, whether or not you're English, whether or not English is your first language. But John Locke was never very popular in England. John Locke was the taste of a small minority of intellectuals. By far the more influential writers in the late 17th and early 18th centuries were people like Albert Sidney. And if you read Albert Sidney's discourses on civil government, there is nothing much you can do. There's pressure to him, never left. This was far more stuff at the time. What kept England free? can be summed up in the Latin phrase first expressed in the 13th century and last in the 19th century. Leges omnii nonimus mutari. We do not want the laws of England to be changed. In the 17th century, there arose the idea in people's minds of an ancient and immemorial constitution. This was carried to what we would often consider to be absurd lengths. In the legal arguments over the validity of Charles I's ship money or his legal taxation in the 1620s, counsel on both sides solemnly raised precedence from the reign of King Edward a thousand years before. There was an assumption in most people's minds that the Parliament which deposed Richard II in 1399 was exactly the same in its forms, procedure, as the Parliament which met in 1641. People might wear different clothes, but everything was unchanged. Later on, this idea of an ancient and immemorial constitution was attached to the idea of change. You'll read this in uh, Blackstone's Commentary for the Laws of England, published in 1764, that there had at one time been this wonderfully perfect liberal English constitution, which had been disrupted by the Norman invasion, and the previous 600 years had been a time of struggle to, to get back our ancient fundamental liberties. But the idea was that the constitution had not changed. If it had changed in the past, it was the worst, and any change now should simply be towards recovering that earlier event. True, or rather not strictly true, but the point is people believed it. And the fact that the constitution was believed not to have changed in the past was an excellent reason for declaring that the constitution should not change now or in the future. The system was legitimized by the fact or the belief in its legitimacy. So, legitimacy was based on its immemoriality. It had always been so, therefore it should always be so. Now, if you look at England in the 18th century with the eye of an outsider, you will see rather less than a libertarian society. You will see many good features, but let us dwell on some bad features. Let's look at the law. The criminal law was a mass of a, a, a mass of injustice. You could be hanged for well over a hundred felonies. If you were tried for those felonies, you were not allowed legal representation. Oh, if there was a question of law raised, counsel was assigned to you. But on pure matter of facts, you were expected to defend yourself. On the other hand, if there was the slightest defect in the procedure, the prosecution case would be thrown out. If there was a spelling mistake in the indictment or a miscall, the whole proceedings were held in null and void. But it meant that criminal trials were often rather likely toss of the coin. Heads, you hang, tails, you go free. 
Eu quero ser um som, não são reais. E por isso, no Civil War, back to the end, there was a massive insurgency. There were three colonial courts, the court of King's Bench, the court of Common Pleas, the court of Exchequer, and there was the court of Chancery in four three entirely different system of law and entity. If you wanted to, if you wanted to start a law case, you, you might need to file proceedings in two or maybe three different courts, which all proceeded at different speeds and in different ways, and you might put in one court and in the other. Everything was slow. Everything was expensive. Many things were deeply uncertain. England was not a libertarian society as we would regard it. Yet England was a free country. There's no doubt about it. It was a free country. The state did not intervene in many areas of life. We were left alone to live very largely as you pleased and of course the taxes for that work. Now, let me continue with the good points about this system. Because everybody believed that the Constitution was legitimized by its antiquity, and because everybody was terrified to raise a single finger against this magnificent structure known as the English Constitution, it meant that the authorities were as tightly served in their behavior as if we had had the sort of constitution the American founding fathers thought they had given to the United States. Let me give you two cases, two examples. Rather. In 1765, the government got a general warrant out to search a prisoner. Now, the, the, the common law said that, the common law said, still says that if you want to search for evidence of a crime, you must get a warrant for a magistrate and you must, you must specify the place to be searched and you must specify what you are searching for. And if there is any defect in the execution of that warrant, the officers involved are liable to criminal or civil prosecution. A, a general one was rather different. It allowed the authorities to go on what the England is called a fishing expedition. There is no address named in the warrant, and there is no specification of the goods to be seized. Um, it is just a general warrant. It allows you to go and do something over and look for evidence of a crime which is not specified. Now, now this procedure come in in the Licensing Act of 1661. The Licensing Act had expired in, I think, 1694. But the procedure for getting a general warrant um, continued because nobody could notice that it would no longer be. And they were not used very extensively. But in 1764, the, one of the secretaries of state got a general warrant to search the premises of a Mr. Carrington printer to see if he was publishing seditious literature. Mr. Entick refused to allow the magistrates and the, uh, and the officers to enter. And he took legal action against the secretary of state. And it went into court. And the judge, Lord, just, Lord Chief Justice can listen to the arguments on both sides, and the government lawyer stood up and said, Well, you know, there may be perhaps some ambiguity as to the warrants, but they're required. I mean, how on earth are you supposed to govern a country with all these people running around publishing sedition? And the judge slapped him down, saying, I'm very sorry, but reason of state is no defense in the court of law. And the government lost. And the Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Carrington, had to pay damages. I think how much it was, about £1,000 or £10,000. Doesn't matter, this is a lot of money by today's standards. And from that time, it was generally believed, generally accepted, that general warrants were illegal in the law. And the government did not rush through an act of parliament shortly afterwards, allowing general warrants. The courts had pronounced these warrants were unconstitutional, therefore they could not be used. 
Now that was something that happened in a time of moderate political excitement. Let me move to another example. 1793, year two of the French Republic, the world's first modern totalitarian killing machine was chewing its way through France. The king had had his head cut off, the queen had had her head cut off. Thousands of people were being put to death with the semblance, not even the semblance, of trial. France was turning upside down, a great cataract of blood everywhere. And there were radicals of England who wanted the same for us. Some of these people were simply misguided, used idiots. Some of them wanted a reign of terror in England. Oh, there was a mess, there was a huge moral panic. There were people running around saying that Tom Penn was fomenting civil war and rebellion. There were people who claimed that little extracts from the rights of man by Tom Paine were being printed on sweet traps and given to children. I mean, you've probably heard all this stuff many times before in other contexts. There is a problem that the government can do something about it. But even when you put aside the exaggeration and the moral panic, there was a conspiracy in England. There was a large and well coordinated radical movement which wanted to do to England what had been done to France. And so in September 1793, the government arrested 12 men, whom it said were the leaders of the English radical movement. A couple of them were people like John Phil, um, a troublemaker, and he would, he would probably have loved to stick a cap of liberty on his head and wander around when people sat off the guillotine. Uh, but most of the people arrested, people like John Paul II, old-fashioned radical, friend of Dr. Johnson, uh, believed in parliamentary reform. Uh, Thomas Harvey, um, a well-intentioned, not entirely intelligent uh, loop, uh, believed that if the working man should get a fair deal, and there should be a bit of parliamentary reform and new tax cuts, that's the thing. But these men came to trial at a time of immense moral panic. I mean, you can stand on, you, you can stand on the cliffs of Dover, and you can look across the channel, and today, if the wind is in the right direction, you can almost smell garlic. 200 years ago, you can look across the channel, and you can almost see the guillotine rising and falling, and people were frightened, and the reason. And these men were brought to trial, and they were given a due process of law. The first trial came on that of John Paul II. The defense counsel, Thomas Erskine, a great advocate. He called the Prime Minister to give evidence to the defense. He subpoenaed the Prime Minister, forced him to leave his house in Downing Street, where he was trying to conduct a war in France, and to walk into the Guild Hall, where the trial was taking place in London, and to give evidence about how he had cooperated with John Paul II nine years earlier in a failed attempt at parliamentary reform. Erskine's speech of events went on, I think, for seven hours. At the end of that time, the jury brought the verdict not guilty. John Holmes, John Ponsu, released. But he tried twice for the same offence. Never touched again by the authorities for the rest of his life, up to around 1814. Next trial came on. Thomas Hahn, the radical boot. Erskine ripped the prosecution over to pieces. It was based on, oh, the usual stuff, agents of provocation, letters steamed open, overheard remarks, hearsay evidence. Um, you can find Erskine's speech in the state trials. It goes on and on and on. Another mad effort. What was really say, at the end of the trial, the jury came back, not guilty, Thomas Hardy released. The third trial came on George Hill. And he was a troublemaker. If he'd be brought on first, the government might have a tradition, but they lost heart. John Thelwall came into court, and the prosecution stood up and said, We're withdrawing all the charges. And Thelwall was rather upset. He said to the judge, Oh, but I want my name in court. 
I will speak, I will say yeah, to you. Yeah. I won't say that because you find it. And the judge threw him out. And that was the end of the treason trials in 1793. And there was no repetition of that. Oh, because the government sharpened up the laws against seditious libel, and if you were an anti establishment journalist, you might find your spider, you might find yourself done over now and again. But the English Constitution, imperfect as it was, had sufficient legitimacy with the majority of people to let us prevent the horrors of England of the French Revolution. It also had sufficient legitimacy with the ruling class, with the powers that be, to prevent in England the sort of horrors that you see in operas like Gideon or Tosca. This sort of nasty, reactionary police court, spying people, torturing people, putting people there without trial. We had none of that. Yes, we had an absurd and chaotic legal system. Yes, there was much questionable about English constitutional law and practice. But the belief that this was an ancient and immemorial constitution preserved us from anything like the French Revolution or anything like the reaction in most other European countries against the French Revolution. The, the constitution was destabilized in the 1830s. The reform of Parliament was well intentioned and perhaps was inevitable. The legal reforms of the years between 1830 and about 1880 were very good. Um, the old legal system was very hard to defend, but you see, it was change. And it was often rapid change. The 19th century reforms did their best to disguise the fact that it was change. The way you maintain the fiction of an ancient and immemorial order of things is by allowing most institutions and most customs and most traditions to continue uninterfered, uninterrupted. Customs die as they become useless and new customs emerge. And every so often there are changes. But these changes take place against an apparently unshifting background. It is possible to say the Constitution is ancient and unchanging, but you make it a tiny change. You make it, there's an all powerful over it, people forget about it. It becomes part of that background of immemoriality. And finally, it's later in another change. The Constitution, as I said, was destabilized by reform. But, as, lately, as, as recently as the 1970s, when I was a boy, it was still possible to believe that nothing much had changed. You see, the way in which England was governed, the customs and institutions of our national life had not changed that much, or seemed to most people not to have changed that much. When I learned about English politics of the 1670s, 1890s, I didn't have to look up glossaries to see what does this title mean? What does that mean? Um, yeah. you know, how does a you know, how does a bill proceed through Parliament? I didn't need to know that. It was history, but it was also current politics. I could use my actual everyday experience of constitutional practice in London to understand the arguments and the proceedings of 300 years ago. And then the collapse came on. The English Constitution could be compared to one of those wonderful Greek temples we've been looking at for the past few days. It stood proud and unbroken for a thousand years. And then many people decided that these things were worthless. And for 200 years, fanatics and thieves chipped away at it, neglected it. He faced it. But at the end of 200 years, these structures were still standing, still very largely what they had been in the past. And then the enemies found a new way of destroying those buildings. You do not 
attack from a front assault. The buildings are too solidly constructed. What do is this? The young people, big tunnels, light fires, the props collapse, bringing the ground down, and bang, there goes your temple. And that's what the left has been doing to my country since the 1960s or the 1970s. I will go to argue where it started. If in 1960 you had brought in, if in 1960 the government had brought in a bill called the Abolition of the Common Law Bill, it would throw that it would be not. So you can't do that. Liberty in England does not depend on a written constitution as in the United States. It depends instead on a web of institutions and assumptions. You cannot abolish Trump or Raju. It's always existed. You can't do that. We've had a great bunch of years. Oh, they can't censor the press. We don't have it. Oh, they can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. There's no constitutional provision that says you can't. You just can't do it because it is not part of our way. And so what you do is you abolish our way. You do it with small but repeated cuts of the market. Who will defend the English system of weights and measures? Thoroughly irrationalized. 12 inches of root, 3 feet to the yard, 1,760 yards per mile. 5,280 feet per mile, um, 360,000 inches per mile, I think, it will take a view. Not very rational, is it? And I won't even describe the way that we weigh things. So, let your case of the system. Yeah, okay, you mean it. What about the old English pounds? 240 pence per pound, divided into 20 shillings of 12 pence. Yeah? Not very sensible, is it? Let's replace it, let's decimalize it, let's have a hundred pence for that. The English county system, 48 counties, um, which do not necessarily correspond with the modern distribution of population. So let's sweep it away, let's divide Yorkshire into three counties, let's partition in Sussex, let's abolish little sets of property. What about English legal procedure? Well, and let's, uh, let's get rid of all this old fashioned language of writs and affidavits and paintings. Let's replace it with claim forms, statements of truth, claims. Surely only a crank, surely only a nutcase would object to these improvements, improvements, improvements. Modernization, that's what they call it. The problem is that after 40 years of this, this web of customs and institutions of the military dependent have been worn very thin. It does still work. It does still work. During the past six months, I've been doing a lot of radio and television work, defending the right of an organization called the British National Party to exist and to be uh, The British National Party is said to be a national socialist movement, there are some national socialists in it, but I think it's more accurate to describe nowadays as a white nationalist. The point is, not matter who they are. I mean, they have a picture of a guest chamber on the front cover of their literature. It doesn't matter. They have a right to say whatever. Now, at first, when I used to go on and defend their right to speak, or to publish, and to organize, I tried making abstract arguments about people's right to express any opinion they like on matters of public, uh, on matters of public policy. This didn't seem to, it didn't seem to get much relevance with people. And so I rapidly switched to this argument. Well, at least men are being prosecuted under laws that didn't exist when I was a boy. When I was born, and so when I was a boy, you could say anything you like to this country on matters of public policy. Anything at all. Why can't we have that right? These laws are illegitimate. And you know, the enemy has no answer to that. They are, they, they sit by silent and embarrassed as people call it one after the other and say, well, I mean, I don't agree with the British National Party, and I think the British Party is a very bad man, so it's all right. Uh, you know, you, you, 
these walls are monstrous. You can't do this. And you do that with them. It still works. It still works. But for how much longer? Um, we are facing not a full front of the whole thing of the world, but though it's becoming that. But we are facing a series of side assaults. You attack the minor things of our national life. You tear up that web of customs and institutions that preserve freedom. And when you've done that, you have things like trial by jury, the result of innocence, the right against self incrimination, the right to freedom of speech. And so you have those things standing alone. They're meant to stand alone, they're meant to be supported by a vast wing of other less important things, but they stand alone. And they go not over one time. And so, I suppose the lesson of what I'm saying today is this we should try not to be arrogant about the power of abstract ideas. They sway our minds, but they don't sway the minds of the masses. We should respect the customs and institutions of ordinary people, so far as we can. These may not be immediately conducive to a free society, but believe me, from my experience in England, once you get rid of things which are not immediately conducive to freedom, things like the English system of weights and measures, you will see that they did have a certain supporting role. And if we ever do win the battle of ideas, in order to get a complete and overpowered thing, so sort of corrupt intellectuals and their and the rest of business interests and other no, best interest groups do not make a recovery. We need to ensure that our ideas are as far as possible in order, not just in a written document, which American experience suggests is by no means enough. We must make sure that our ideas are embodied in the practices and beliefs and customs and traditions of daily life. Ideas are important. Ideas, in a sense, change the world. But if you want to influence ordinary people, you don't just throw a couple of volumes of rock or a need to drop off. They're not ready for that. They're good. And I'm not criticizing them because of it. They're just not up to it in the same way as I'm not up to deciding what is the best policy. We need to be rather more sophisticated in our defense, in our attack, and if we ever get it, in our triumph. Now, one last point. Um, the English conservatism is so ill-funded and so ill-organized that we have to print and find our own books. And this is one of them, it's a couple of years old. Um, I meant to sell out 50 copies. Unfortunately, I sold out 3,000 because the people keep ordering the thing. I keep promising to revise it and double the size of it, but um, I, did, I did throw some together before I came out. Some of them are very badly bound, and my wife looked at them and said, You don't take those, are you? And I said, Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I normally sell them the gross price of 18 pounds 99. I put back to that price to stop them from buying because it's too much trouble to print and buy them. <laughs> you can have them for um uh, you can have them for what is 10 Turkish euro? Is that a reasonable price? That's like four pounds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 10 euro. And I've had my heart out. Thank you very much for your indulgence.